Eternal God, our Father, we give you the preeminence of our lives. And Father, we pray that you will hallow this place with your presence. We pray that you'd bring every mind and every thought into the captivity of your will. And Father, we pray that as we engage our hearts, we pray that the word of God will find a lodging place and that we would bring forth fruit as unto righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, choir. That was wonderful as usual. Uh, we thank you for choosing to spend this time in worship with us this morning because God is good all the time. I want to express thanks and gratitude to everyone, the staff, the volunteers who helped make this service happen today. And we especially want to welcome any guests who might be with us today. We have a guest book in the lobby, and we invite you to join us for coffee, cookies, and conversation across the hall after the service. Uh, come meet your, your village's chapel villagers. I, I knew I was going to have trouble saying that. <laughs> so as we get started with today's service, I want to highlight some announcements. Some are on your program, and some are not. First, our flowers today are, in are provided by Colleen Marandino. Hi, Colleen. Um, these are in loving memory of her precious daughter, Denise. Thank you, Colleen. Next, uh, a very important form in your, in your bulletin. We're asking everyone who worships with, her, with us to consider taking on some small role, active role, in helping us make this service happen every week. Indeed, many hands make light work. In most of the categories, you'll be part of a larger team who would always be available to uh, assist, support, and substitute in for you if you have other plans. Um, if everyone is sharing, we can organize in a way that we would have to only you'd only have to work a few times a year, which would be wonderful if we had that many people sharing. Um, the form, anyway, the form is in your bulletin. The pins are on the table out in the lobby. Um, I'll try to be there to answer if you have any questions about what do these people do, what do those people do. Um, hopefully I can help you or I can point you to the person who can. So, okay, the next one is not in your bulletin, but uh, we've been advertising it heavily. So hopefully you know that today is the concert that where we're going to feature our organ and Catherine and our viola and Mark. He looks calm as a cucumber. <laughs> Two o'clock, bring your neighbors. It's free. You might want to arrive a little earlier. It's going to, we hope it's going to be, we pray it's going to be busy. So, okay, and then my final announcement that's not on the bulletin is that next Sunday after church is homecoming slash hot dog Sunday. <laughs> Bill is obviously looking forward to it. Yes. Me too. Any meal I don't have to cook is a great meal. <laughs> so we're, we'll be meeting over in the Sequoia room, right? And coffee and cookies will be over there too. The Sequoia room, the Redwood room. There's three rooms. I forget the third name. But they're that all, all that big gathering space there. <coughs> Excuse me, the fall allergies are really getting me this year. Anyway, um, on to my comments. So this month, Pastor Bill is taking us on a journey of revival and rejuvenation. He's felt called to do that, and we need it. Last week, he left us with seven points that we could ponder during the week, points that will help prepare us for our personal revival. The point that was stuck in my brain all week was the need for constant confession. As I've shared with you before, I had very little spiritual guidance in my early years. But when I joined my first church, and I was in my 40s by then, I became a Methodist, and I finally felt at home in God's house. Hallelujah. The two Methodist congregations that I'd previously belonged to always prayed a prayer of confession during every Sunday service. It was printed right there in the bulletin, um, and we all prayed it out loud. And there was a new one every week. <laughs> Initially, this confused me because the prayers of confession written in my bulletin, how could they always be so spot on? <laughs> how do they, who, who here knew exactly what I needed? 
to ask forgiveness for. How could that be? Was it the church? Was it the pastor? I don't know. Well, <laughs> eventually I came to learn that there's a whole book of worship <laughs> that collects and contains these thousands and thousands of prayers of confession. Still, it took me a little while longer to understand that the reason they all rang so true and that they all seemed so relevant to most of us is even that even though we are all God's children, we've also all been given free will. <laughs> and as Pastor Bill puts it, we're imperfect people. These prayers of confession highlighted our numerous collective imperfections. It turns out that free will and imperfect people can be a slippery slope. <laughs> so do you have a lot of mental junk in your brain that's distracting you? Is it taking up space in your consciousness and diminishing your time spent in relationship with our Lord? Do you continue to mentally wrestle with things that are out of your power? You can't even influence, let alone resolve, most of these things you worry about. At least I do. So we all need confession. Blessedly, confession is an easy fix. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 assures that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us for our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, no matter how many times we go. <laughs> I find that a lot of my current mental junk is related to our, uh, and, and anxiety, is related to our upcoming election process and the incessant news coverage. So I decided to see if I could write a confession. <laughs> I'm not going to make you say it with me, and I didn't have her printed in the bulletin, but I, it was real easy to write, actually. <laughs> so I'll close with that. Heavenly Father, I confess that I'm frequently distracted by worldly things. I sometimes neglect to acknowledge your absolute power over all things. I often fail to pray for my enemies as well as my friends. Please forgive me. Amen. Okay. Okay, so now if you would stand if you're able and join in singing our first congregational hymn, which is, He Touched Me appropriately, and remain standing for our time of silent prayer.
convene into a moment of silent prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to commune with you and to offer up our individual concerns and our individual requests. Thank you. Amen. Okay.
I don't know about you this morning, but it's really clear to me that I'm only here because of God's grace. He woke us up this morning. We may not have felt 100% when we got up, but we're up and we're here to have an encounter with a God that loves us far beyond we can ever comprehend. Broken people as we are, imperfect people as we are, yet he loves us. He knows us intimately. He understands what keeps us going. And I want you to engage with me in asking him, Lord, renew my spirit. Because we get weary in this land of woe. And we need the Lord to renew our spirit. Father God, we come together as one. And Father, we know that we live in a world that is 180 degrees going in the opposite direction. And we're having to swim upstream. Lord, renew our spirit that, Lord, as you look upon us, you see the blood of Jesus has been applied to our lives, and you get a clear reflection of your image in us. Lord, we praise you. We bless you. Thank you for being our healer and our deliverer, and we pray for those of us who are stuck in grief and afflicted, that you would touch us today just to make us aware that you know where we are and that you're with us. Lord, as you've taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and deliver us from evil, from temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stay engaged.
We may not be there yet, but keep living. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Let us stand for the doxology. God, we praise you, we thank you for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And Lord, we return with gifts for the kingdom of God, and we pray that you'd bless those who have given from their abundance and those out of their need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Mark and Catherine, choir, and um, Cindy, and all of those of you who have gathered today on this very, very special day. And what makes it special? Because this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we're here in our place of worship. Thank God for this community center that allows us to come together as a group of believers that we may continue our journey of faith. Uh, I gave you seven steps last week, and I trust, I trust that you read your assignment. And your assignment was Matthew chapter 24. And you may not clearly understand where I'm going, but keep following and we'll all get there together. We shall meet him in the air. That is our theme for the month of October. And as we go through Sunday through Sunday, it is going to be crystal clear how we're going to experience meeting him in the air. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus and his disciples gathered at the temple of Jerusalem and began to tell them, and Jesus was telling them about the destruction of the temple. Several approached Jesus with concerns about the temple's destruction in Jerusalem, as we would be concerned if they told us that they were going to destroy the community center. They're not going to do that. Amen. Praise God. They're going to enhance it. Hallelujah. They're going to make it better. And they asked questions concerning when that would occur and when will the Lord return and at the end of the age. When will the end of the age be? The temple in A.D. 700, 70, was destroyed when the Roman army under Titus led siege to Jerusalem, destroying the temple and leaving no stone upon the other. So that occurred. Jesus informed his disciples that after he returned to heaven, many false messiahs would appear and deceive many. Many places would have wars and famines and pestilence and earthquakes. And I think that we top the list as far as earthquakes because we have them just about every day and they're unknown uh, to us. We don't feel the, the full breath of the earthquake, but they occur. He tells them that there would be a great time of, of falling away and believers betraying one another. He tells them that there would be a great time of tribulation that the world has never known, and the gospel has to reach every person available and living during the time before Christ returns. We must be vigilant with the time given to us as Christ's witnesses because we have been called to be Christ's witness. Amen. You have been called into relationship with Jesus Christ to be his witness, not to be your witness, not to be the chapel's witness, not to be the village's witness, not to be your family's witness, but to be his witness. So you've been called out and set apart to be a witness for Jesus Christ because of what he has done in your life. We must affirm and remain faithful in holding up the light of God's love in the, in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We affirm by the word of the Lord that Jesus Christ's return is imminent so that we will meet him in the air. I don't hear an, a hallelujah or a praise the Lord. I think it's very exciting that we're going to have the privilege of meeting the Lord in the air. Our scripture text is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 41. We're going to go verse by verse. Verse 36, but about that day, the day when the Lord returns, or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but 
only the Father. The disciples in Jesus' day wanted to know how long they had to wait for Jesus to return. Just like us, we are wondering, Lord, how long do we have to put up with this and go through this and wait for you? So our wait is no different than their wait. They were anxious for the Lord to return, and we should be anxious for his return and align our lives according to his will. They desired him to rule, to return, and sit upon his earthly throne. They desired him to rule with the rod of iron uh, to destroy the oppressors of their generation. And how we would like for the Lord to arrive and take care of all of these busy bodies and these liars and deceivers and murderers and criminals and, and all of those individuals who have caused us torment and afflictions. So our desire is the same as their desire. Without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, they lacked an, an, an eternal perspective of God's long-suffering. Did you know God was long-suffering? Did you know that God was long-suffering? He is long-suffering. He is waiting because he does not want to see anyone miss heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So the disciples did not have the Holy Spirit to give them an enlightenment concerning the long-suffering of God. They wanted Jesus to turn, return immediately, like yesterday, like last week, like last month, like last year, like 50 years ago. Whatever the case may be, they wanted him to return. And God is long-suffering. For those serious about knowing and following the Lord God, God's long-suffering gives them time and opportunity to repent, to receive eternal life. God wants everyone to have eternal life. Did you know that? God wants everyone to live eternally in his presence. No matter the condition of their hearts, no matter the condition of their lives at this present time, he gives them time and opportunity to come to reconciliation and receive the gift of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus declared that only the Father knew the exact day and moment of his return. While men calculate, predict, uh, the, the secret remains with Father God. And we've had uh, those who have gone before us, they've died. But they had charts and timetables and all of this. And they said, well, it was going to be in this month, in this year, on this day. Do you remember any of those? I certainly do. And all they had to do was go back to the Word of God and understand that it's in the Father's timetable, not our timetable. Not as we see it, not as we perceive it, but it's going to happen according to God's timetable. God the Father delays Jesus' return until our families, perhaps friends and neighbors whom we have been assigned to share Jesus Christ with have a valid opportunity to accept or reject him. So God places you, and he placed you in the villages, and he placed you among neighbors. Hello. You as a light, you as a living witness, a living epistle, he has placed you among other people in your neighborhood, on your street, on your block, in your village. Why? To be a witness. So that people would know that whether the world is hopeless, that they can look at you 
and says, this person is different. They're hopeful. They're different. They're hopeful. They always see on the bright side of life, on the positive side of life. And I want to be around positive people. Hallelujah, somebody. So God has blessed us uh, to have time with our neighbors to love them as ourselves. If we haven't been praying for them, start today. And Lord, I confess, I haven't been praying for my neighbors like I should. But as a result of God making me aware that I should be praying for them on a daily basis that they may come to know Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. Amen. You're there for God's purpose. You're there for God's glory. You're there for the light that shines in darkness. You are light. And we are to engage them. From this day forward, we must pray more fervently, focusing on those who will forever be lost if they neglect God's grace in having an eternal relationship with him. God doesn't give a hill of beans about religion. Hello. He wants relationship. He wants relationship. There are a lot of religious people that have no relationship with God. Hello. Hello. But they're connected to religion and not connected to God the Father through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who God sent to be the mediator between God and man so that we can know him more intimately. Verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to be like the days of Noah. Well, what were the days of Noah like? Jesus refers to a historical event that drastically shifted God's righteous judgment against the people and the people's wickedness. It was a time when God regretted that the people were living to please their fleshly nature without regard to being accountable to him. Now, as children that have come from parents. Your parents raised you to be accountable. First to them, right? I'm your mother. I'm your father. You do what I say because I know best. Hello, somebody. So God created us in his image, in his likeness, so that we could be a reflection of him in the earth who we are accountable to. We don't dance to the music, do your thing. Hello. Do what you want to do. That's not our beat. That's not our music. We are in submission to the will of God. We want to do God's bidding. The time of the coming of the Son of Man would be the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus called himself the Son of Man to emphasize his humanity and fulfill the Mosaic prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. In my vision, Daniel is saying, at night I looked and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power over all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is on is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom. There is no one that will never be destroyed. Whose kingdom are you in? Whose kingdom are you in? Come on, are you in the kingdom of God? Well, say so, will you? Don't get us confused. 
We are a part of the kingdom of God. It is an eternal kingdom. It is in the everlasting kingdom. We will live forever as children of God because we have been reconnected to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Hello, somebody. Verse 38, for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. So people were busy being, being busy. Our times mirror the days of Noah when people were driven to satisfy their human desires while neglecting their souls. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? People are all tied up and wrapped up about getting this and doing this and doing that and neglecting their eternal souls. The soul is going to live forever. The body reminds us on a daily basis that, hey, I didn't, you're not going to stay in, in this body because it's breaking down. Hello? If you don't feel it, keep living. It'll, you'll feel it. It'll come to you. Praise the Lord. Life would be business as usual for them. People live without accountability to anyone and were controlled by the thoughts of their hearts and the thoughts of their desires. People acted out like they're acting out in our day. If you make them upset or you do something, they want to end it. They want to end your life. So we don't know how to approach people sometimes because we don't know where their mind is at. We don't know what they're thinking. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 through 8 says, And the Lord saw the great wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race, and I that I have created and with them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them and I love a good B-U-T in the word of God and verse 8 says but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord praise God that you and I can find favor with the Lord. We're not perfect people. Hello? But he found favor with the Lord because God knew his heart. God knows your heart. God knows each and every person's heart. And God knew that he could depend upon Noah to carry out his purpose. Verse 39, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. That's how it's going to be when Jesus returns. People are going to be busy, caught up in politics and caught up in this and caught up in that and not realize that, okay, time is up. I have been long-suffering with you, but the time of your visitation has come. It's tragic to get caught off guard, isn't it? Mankind was given 120 years of warning to repent to God and be saved from the flood, while nor labor to build an ark for the people in a place where people, well, what, why is this here? What, what are you doing? God spared Noah, his wife, 
three sons, their wives, and the animal kingdom. And I, I'm thinking that they must have been very young animals. And, you know, we have the pictures of all of these real tall giraffes and all of these big animals going into the ark two by two. But they must have been small. Hello. So that there would be room for them all. Because we know that there was male and female and God created them to multiply. Hello. And so it wasn't animals coming off the ark two by two, but there were animals coming off the ark that had little ones. Come on, hey. Because they had to replenish and reproduce because God had destroyed what? All living things on the earth through the flood. The people did not take it seriously because it may have never rained with any significant capacity during Noah's day. Some people said it didn't rain at all. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I know that it rained 40 days and 40 nights and it didn't let up. They took their lives for granted and believed Noah was out of touch with their reality. Eventually, God's judgment came to those who had ignored the warnings. It came suddenly and unexpectedly. Verse 41, verse 40, 41, two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. It's like the things that we do every day. Women prepare meals for families every day. So we've got golfers here. Hallelujah. We've got pickleball players here. Hallelujah. We've got tennis players here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And on the day that Jesus comes, you are going to be winding up. And there's nobody going to be there that you can throw the ball to or hit the ball to. Or getting ready to swing that club. And the people that you're hooked up with, well, where did they go? I thought Susie was here right by my side. Where, where? I see her clubs, I see her golf cart. Where did she go? It is going to be dramatic. One will go with the Lord, and the unbeliever will remain here on this earth. It will be a sad day. It will be a day that will be worldwide. People will be missing. And those that remain will have to go through some very, very hard, challenging times. Your application, we are called to live life with an eternal perspective because we were created for eternity. You're going to live forever. Praise the Lord. You're going to live forever. Praise the Lord. You're going to live forever. Praise the Lord. Now you choose where that will be. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Freedom of choice. Praise God. Yeah. We have freedom of choice. So what do you choose? Do you choose to be in God's eternal presence? Or do you choose to remain the way that everybody is conducting their lives as if they are not accountable to anyone. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is, that he is, and he's the Lord and he is the King of Kings. He has total dominion. 
Number two, we are given time and opportunity to choose our eternal destiny. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, somebody. I'm so glad that you chose to be here to hear this message. And I pray that this message does not fall on deaf ears or hard hearts. But I pray that this message has fallen in your heart to bring forth seed. Get away from me, fly. Seeds of righteousness that in the days that God has given us, that we will be more fervently in prayer and fervent and zealous in communicating our love to our neighbors and our love to our family and our no love to other people that we know are living outside of the boundaries. Hello. Are you willing to take up the challenge that has been laid before you? I've given you seven steps to create the atmosphere, create the opportunity for revival, not just personal revival, but revival in your family, revival in the neighborhood, that people will be awakened to the reality that soon and very soon that some of us are going where? To see the king. Soon and very soon, some of us are going to meet the Lord. Father God, we praise you, we bless you, we thank you, God, for your sustaining grace. For it is you who works in us to will and to do of your good pleasure. And Father, I pray that you were pleased with everything that we've all done together in this place this morning. We've heard the word of God. We received the word of God. And Father, we repent of our sins and we ask, Lord, that you will renew our strength and give us the ability to lean into you and to reach our neighbors, to reach our family, to reach those who may have rejected us. Lord, help us to be wise as serpents and gentle as lambs in reaching those with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. and amen. So be it, Lord. So be it. Praise the Lord.